Welcome to a special bonus episode of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. I'm your host, Scott Fowler, sports columnist for the Charlotte Observer, where I've worked since 1994. And to close out our first season, we're going behind the scenes of the reporting and pulling back the curtain on the show to share some of our favorite moments. I'm joined today in the studio by two legends in their own right. Jeff Siner is the visual journalist who is by my side for all 15 Sports Legends interviews in Season 1. He shot all the photo and video and recorded all the audio that went with every episode. He's been at The Observer even longer than I have, working for us for 34 years. That's what I want to know as the story is what where have these people been touched by someone else? What's the impact of someone else's life on them? And for the first part of this episode, we will also be joined by Raina Cash, the Charlotte Observer's executive editor who greenlit this series and herself covered and edited sports for a large portion of her prestigious career. Be able to sit across from these guys and, and see them work their magic uh, on this podcast that I think really uh, has resonated. Kata Stevens is joining us virtually from her home studio in New York and will be moderating this conversation. She produced and edited this podcast as the audio producer at McClatchy's National Bureau. I, I'm listening to that tape and I'm feeling very, very emotional. And I learned so much working through this era of sports that maybe I wasn't so familiar with. This conversation has been edited for length and clarity. All right, so Scott, let's talk about the show's origins. Scott came to us at the National Bureau with this idea in the spring of this past year at a point when it seemed like COVID had died down and we were all just kind of trying to make some connections, which I think is kind of valid to what we did here as well. Scott, can you tell us about your thought process here with pitching the show, um, both to us and to The Observer, and your insistence that these interviews happen in person? Yes. So I guess what happened was over the years, and I've been here almost 29 years, so I've got a lot of gray hair, as does visual journalist Jeff Siner. <laughs> and so we like to talk sometimes about some of our favorite interviews over the years. And as, I, as we've done that a couple of times, I've realized they were always in person. They were very often with someone who had a lot of stories to tell because they have lived a lot of life. But sometimes I'd walk out of those interviews and go, I wish other people had experienced that. And I wanted readers and listeners to be able to experience a little more. So we pitched the idea to y'all and to uh, all the folks at The Observer that we would go and do these interviews. And Jeff Siner, I wanted to be uh, right at my side every step of the way because he knows all these people, too. He's been at The Observer even longer than I have. And so... And I was happy to hear it. Uh, <laughs> um, so we started out, if you recall, at the beginning of the year, asking everyone on staff to to bring us the story they want to be known for for the year, something that they would be really excited about. And uh, when uh, you and Jeff brought this uh, to our attention, I think we were all sort of on the edge of our seat, like this has a great deal of potential. And uh, for myself, being a longtime sports writer and sports editor before uh, moving on, on to the news side, I was especially excited about it. But a lot of times you hear about these types of approaches, and it's uh, sort of where are they now? And what was really different about this is this wasn't that kind of story. It was, uh, or series of stories, this was going to be not only catching you up with where they are now, but stories you've never heard before, stories that you thought you knew, uh, but now this is an opportunity for you to dig a little deeper and learn more. It was revelatory in nature and much more personal. Um, people could get to know the subjects in a way that they had never known or experienced them before. And so that was the part of it that I knew would make Sports Legends of the Carolinas really unique and, and not just... Um, it would be nostalgic, but it would also open up new chapters for us. Sure. And and being a millennial, I'm I'm a part of the nostalgia generation. So I love <laughs> that. But and when we look at show pitches, we're looking for content that is locally based, but could have some national resonance in our other markets. And Charlotte obviously has been such a great 
you know, breeding ground for audio content with Scott's Caruth. And we thought it was perfect. Reina, you, you've been pretty intimately involved in a few of, of the episodes that, that we produced here in this first season. But do you have any favorites? That's a tough question because they were all so good, so rich, uh, so interesting. You learn something new and and different about every single person that they talked to and spent spent time with. And the videos were excellent. Um, I really especially enjoyed uh, the episode with Charlie Scott, uh, the first black player at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and all of the things that he went through just to get to North Carolina in the first place, the recruitment process, the harsh and cruel insults that he had to face as a black man making history in, in this state in particular. I didn't get an opportunity to enjoy all the things that I accomplished. I didn't get an opportunity to, I, I didn't get an opportunity to enjoy college. I, I, I didn't get really to enjoy college. I got the opportunity to go to college, but not to enjoy college. I felt like everyone felt like, well, you know, he was a star around just all white players, you know. So I had, I always felt like I was always having to prove that I was just as good as other players, you know, because I mean, because, you know, as a black ball player that went to all white school and played in an all white conference, People say, well, you were good because you just did, you just played in an all white conference. You did not play against, you know, you did not play in the Big Ten or you did not play in the Far West. You did not play against, you know, you played in a conference where you were the only one for the whole, whole time. So, you know, are you really that good? And so I've always felt like I had to always prove, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, my ability as, as far as being, uh, um, you know, capable of playing, you know, uh, with anybody. So he was much more than just a great basketball player. And there's there's a lot more to his quote unquote legacy. So I really appreciated that. Um, I love the episode with Muggsy Bogues. <laughs> uh, you know, he's everybody's favorite. Everybody um, loves Muggsy. Yeah. Everybody loves Muggsy. <laughs> um, just the just great, great stories, you know, um, about him and what brought him to Charlotte and what his experience here in Charlotte was like. And um, I was fortunate enough to be here the day that uh, Roy Williams came into the studio to talk with us. And I think he walked in and I was holding a basketball in my hand. And um, as a former basketball player in high school, I was very athletic, but I couldn't shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and I could barely dribble, but I could jump and I could run fast. But anyway, he complimented me on uh, the, the way that I held the ball and I looked like a point guard. And so we got a good laugh out of that. Um, and that was a great episode with him talking about the Jordan moments and his, his favorite moments and walking away from Carolina. You know, there were, there were a lot of them to love, but those are a few that stuck out to me. One of the things that's so unique about this show is that largely, Scott, you you have pre-existing relationships with most of the legends that you and Jeff spoke with. How did you go about choosing the legends that you wanted to reach out to for this first season and then doing that outreach? Well, my first rule was no jerks allowed. I love it that. It had to be nice people, people that I liked uh, interviewing because, I mean, there's a lot of legends. Um, we've got a list in our, in our uh, folder I have somewhere of like, 80 more possibilities that we need to cut down eventually. But uh, what rose to the top to me, uh, Kata, was that they I wanted people who had interesting stories. As Raina mentioned, I wanted people who you thought you knew, but you really maybe didn't, because maybe they had to be a little more guarded when they were still in the arena, so to speak. And most of the people we did have retired. Not everyone. Steph Curry, we did, and he's – you know, the reigning uh, defending champion in the NBA. And Dawn Staley might win another national championship this year at South Carolina. But most of them, I wanted uh, people who had lived some life, had gone through some things, had triumphed over adversity. And obviously, they needed to be very talented at what they did. Beyond that, though, uh, you know, I honestly, I talked to, and I'll let Jeff chime in on this, but Jeff Siner was a huge help to me because he, knows sports history really well. This is our visual journalist, did all the photos, which are fantastic, did the videos, which just are so rich in detail. But Jeff also is just kind of a sports historian. And so, Jeff, you honestly helped me uh, choose 
some of these subjects. And of course, we had Raina's input and some of our sports editors' input as well. Yeah, that was part, that was part of the the real fun of it was coming up the, with the initial list. I mean, I go back to each one of them, and there's a little nugget with each one of them that would sort of tug at me as I was sitting there listening, and it would touch me and make me think about things maybe that you know I'd encountered in my own life or I've seen with other people and just to see their perseverance and how they overcame. Um, just a wonderful time. And I think we got better at it as we went. Um, I listened to some of my earlier interviews during it, and I've been doing this job a long time. Uh, but still, I think uh, interviewing for a podcast and, and what we were doing was is a little bit different. And I would hear myself in the tape and just cringe a little bit and say, Scott, shut up. Let them talk. <laughs> Why do you keep asking long suitcase type questions, short questions? Somebody told me the best question ever uh, was why? Just one word. Why? Because it goes to motivation. So I use. I tried to as I as it got. You know, it kept going. Uh, I tried to make my questions shorter. And remember that while Jeff and I were sort of the co-directors of these stories and episodes, the interview subject was the star. You had to make them look good. You have to set them up. We're sort of the point guard, and they're the ones who are shooting and need to score with their stories, their quotes, their anecdotes. And so I did a lot of research before each one to be able to ask them questions that went beyond a little bit. How'd you feel when you made that big shot? Like we tried to get a little past that. And that's the places where I felt, you know, were the deepest and the richest when we got, when it stopped being that we were in front of microphones and it started being like, we're sitting in somebody's living room and having a conversation over coffee. I think the relationship between you two is probably just as important hearing that as the relationship that Scott has with some of these legends. But one of the things that I loved most about these interviews is that you could really get a sense of your connection with some of these people because of your laughter, because of the candid manner in which you spoke with a lot of these people. And as as we kind of think about the different people that we included in this first season, one of the things that this show, I think, does such a great job of is representing the diversity of the legends here in the Carolinas from a sport perspective. You know, we went all across the spectrum of sports from a career perspective with with just different occupations within sport, also from a gender and race and social issues in general perspective. And, you know, last year, McClatchy's National Bureau partnered with The Observer to expose injustices in women's soccer in a podcast called Payback, which listeners can find wherever they get their podcasts. But for this first season of Sports Legends of the Carolinas, we put a spotlight on several famous women in sport, two of whom were Dawn Staley and Charlotte Smith. And our director of audio, my boss, Davin Coburn, made a really neat observation about the way in which these two women see their jobs. And to distill his line of thought, it's essentially that those two jobs are totally different for each of them. They're both invested in the development of their young athletes, but Staley is preparing athletes for the next phase of their careers. And Smith sees her job as preparing young people for the next phase of their lives outside of sport. And I want to play a, a clip here of our Charlotte Smith interview that kind of demonstrates the way that she sees her career. I knew when I became a head coach that I wanted to be somewhere where people really embraced and understood what it meant to be a student athlete, where it embodied the holistic approach of what it means to be a student athlete. Because at the end of the day, like really how many people will go pro? Right. You know, I keep a flat basketball to remind my players that that ball will eventually stop bouncing. Hmm. And so for me, I wanted to be somewhere where I really had something to offer other than just being able to play on this court. Um, What are we doing to position them for life after sport? You know, it's easy to say that we graduate players. A lot of people can say 100 percent graduation. I can even say that. But it's not just enough to hand them a diploma. It's like, what are we doing? Are we doing internships? Are we doing the research? Are we doing community service, study abroad? You know, there's a lot of things 
here that was just like, wow, Elon is doing it right. And they're really preparing student athletes for life after college. So that was really important to me. It was one of the most surprising things to me here. And I was just kind of wondering how how you all saw just the diversity of ideas in between those two conversations. I think that they they are obviously both incredible women who have a history as athletes, but as coaches who we don't hear from in such an intimate manner very often. What were your impressions comparing those two interviews? Well, for those who maybe didn't listen to all those episodes um, that are listening to this, of course, Dawn Staley is the most famous women's coach in maybe the world right now. She coaches the University of South Carolina women's basketball team, favored to win its third national championship this year. And she and Charlotte Smith were actually teammates here in Charlotte for the WNBA's Charlotte Sting. Uh, but Charlotte Smith, who won a national championship uh, as a player at UNC, now coaches at a much lower profile level where she coaches Elon. Um, and she's has made the NCAA tournament, but realistically, Elon is not going to be in the hunt for a national championship. So um, I don't know what you thought about it, Raina, but I thought it was it was really interesting. They do the very same jobs, but they're really they're almost their end goals are a little different, or at least, you know, everyone Don Staley recruits thinks they're going to go to the WNBA. If you're, if you're at Elon, you're probably not going to be a WNBA player. You're going to be something else. Says a lot about uh, their coaching ability, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can have an impact and influence on, on people no matter what level you're on. Um, and these aren't women who are uh, egotistical. They just want to do the best job to give back of everything that they've uh, that has been poured into them. They want to give back to their student athletes. And I was thinking today, uh, as we were talking about uh, Don Staley and how instrumental her voice has been in the release of Brittany Griner, mm -hmm. and uh, Brittany Griner landed back in the United States after being um, imprisoned in Russia. And um, just Don's, how important it, it is to her to be larger than a basketball coach. And she talked about that in the episodes. She did. Um, and I, I believe that, that Charlotte is the same way, uh, that these kinds of things mean a lot to them, that they're, it's more than just about what happens on the court. Um, and to me, that's what, even beyond their connection on the court as players, that's what connects them as, as women leaders. You know that Don Staley in our interview had a little button. If you look closely in all of Jeff's pictures, a little button that says either BG or free BG or something. It's it's a it's a testament to Brittany Griner. Don't forget her. And right, she's finally been released after how many days was it? I mean, so many days. But and Dawn, of course, when she won the national championship, sent pieces of the net to every African American. Uh, head women's basketball coach. And Charlotte Smith was one of those. She has a piece of the net from Dawn Staley, who really likes to be a, a connector. Let's play that part of the conversation back. Two years before we won our, our national championship in 2017, Carolyn Peck, who was the first black coach, female coach, to win a national championship in 1999, an analyst doing some of our games, a lot of our games. And she pulled me to the side, won a shoot around. And she told me the story about um, one of one of her teammates gave her a piece of her national championship net. And she thought that paying it forward in this way and giving me a piece of piece of her 1999 national championship net would be the perfect way that um, someone giving her their piece of the net and how it impacted her and how she was able to give it back. That was the most important thing. And she said, once you win your national championship, I just want you to return it to me and then pay it forward to someone else, another coach. And then I just thought about sharing it with other uh, black coaches on the Division One level because I know the struggle and I know um, what that little piece of nine line, what hope it brought to them. And, and I knew that, Everyone, every one of them would not win a national championship, but their national championship is 
maybe um, being a part of a first generation graduate on their team. Uh, maybe they needed some hope in, in, in everyday life and dealing with young people and parents and all of that. And if they can look and feel that piece of nylon and, and have the energy uh, to, to hurdle, you know, some of the obstacles that, that, that they're faced with, that's, that's to me is a national championship like um, honor and award and celebration and all of those things. So I, I thought it was a, uh, I thought it was a great connection piece um, for 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 black coaches. And I thought that was one of the coolest things about some of these episodes. Some of these connections we didn't really know. Like if you listen back, Roy Williams, Charlie Scott, and Phil Ford all have sort of give you Dean Smith from a different viewpoint of a you know a slightly different Dean Smith as the um, a, a sort of a champion of integration. Dean Smith as a coach, Dean Smith as a friend and golf partner for Roy Williams and a mentor. And you just so I didn't really think of it until they all ended up talking about Dean Smith, uh, but in different sorts of ways. And there's several, uh, several sort of those uh, happy coincidences throughout these episodes. Well, Raina, I know you've got <laughs> lots going on as the executive editor of The Observer here. Thank you so, so much for coming in and joining us and giving us your insight on this project, which has been a really fun experiment and experience. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm the lucky one to uh, to be able to sit across from these guys and, and see them work their magic uh, on this podcast that I think really... Uh, has resonated and look forward to see what's happening in the future. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. So to keep things moving, there were, there were a few themes that we found throughout this season. And Scott, you touched on one with just kind of the interconnectivity. One of the reasons I love that clip from Staley is that it really kind of exemplifies how these legends carry on and leave their legacies. And I think another great example of that is the conversation that you had with Dale Earnhardt Jr., who to me is obviously a legend, but I didn't grow up with racing. I was not in like a racing following family. And so his stories were largely very new to me. Can you can you talk about why he was so integral to include in the first season for you guys? Sure. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jeff, I think was a top any list we made. Uh, he would have been if we, we did 15 episodes. But if we had only done five episodes, Dale Jr. would have still been one of them uh, to me because I've interviewed him a bunch over the years. He is remarkably introspective, verbal, honest, authentic, and happened to be the son of the greatest racer in NASCAR history, in my opinion. So all that combined, plus the fact he turned me on to watching The Office before I knew what The Office was. Um, this was real, real early. Um, back when I didn't know how to pronounce Steve Carell's name. So it was that early that Dale Earnhardt Jr. said, by the way, you should be watching this show called The Office. And I was like, really? Okay, I'll check it out. And, you know, here we are. Can I can I just real quick get your your early pronunciation of Steve Carell? Was it like? <laughs> yes. My early pronunciation of Steve Carell was Steve Carroll, as in Christmas Carol. <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> yep. Love it. Um, so yeah, the, the, all that, but he just is, uh, he's got it all really, Jeff, don't you think? I mean, Dale Earnhardt Jr. in 30 years of doing this, uh, there's very few people who approach sort of his level for, a, for an interviewer like us, uh, he's gold, I guess you would say. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at the history of NASCAR, I mean, I think he broke the record for most popular driver by the fans' vote. Um, you, when you see him and you talk with him or you hear him talk, it, you just want more. Um, I mean, he's just such a down-to-earth person. He's humble. He's, he's honest. He's thoughtful. He just has all these wonderful um, characteristics. And, you know, he's very open about his career. 
um, you know, when he wasn't trying hard enough. He was playing video games before practice, you know. He'd sit in there and everyone else would be in their car and he'd still be saying, I've got one more minute to play more of this video game and stuff. I mean, to have that openness to share that, hey, I could have been a better driver if I had done yeah, this. Yeah, I could have won more. I mean, he says in the podcast he could have won, I forget how many more races, but he says he could have won more races if he had been more dedicated. And one quote, I think, Jeff, both you and I, when we're looking back at the season, I think resonated with both of us, is when Dale Jr. is talking about his father, Dale Sr., and says that he lost his leader. And Absolutely. that when that happened... And I think he was so honest about this. It was horrible. He went through all the terrible emotions you'd expect when you lose a parent. But also there was this almost a feeling of relief because no one was going to make Dale Earnhardt Jr. do anything he didn't want to do for a while. And that was his dad was was what do you call him? The ceiling. I think yeah, it was yeah. the ceiling. Well, you know, yeah. he he says in the interview that he all of a sudden if he gets up, if he wakes up at nine o'clock in the morning, there's nobody calling him, telling him. Hey, yeah. you got to get up and you got to be Get here. your butt over here. You're late. That He can go anywhere he wants. Yeah. He could get in his car and drive and just keep going, and nobody would be there. I photographed Dale Sr. the first part of my whole career, all the, all the way up until he passed away. And I was intimidated by him. When he'd walk through the garage or he would stop to speak, he just had a presence about him. And Junior has a presence about him. It's not the, the same as his father. His dad was a large man, very tall, rugged, just a, you knew he was a competitor and he was, he knew he was a great racer and he was going to prove that every time he got in the car. Junior, very laid back. He was, as you would say, chill. Um, you know, he wore his ball cap backwards. He'd come out and sort of lounge around the car and everything, but still just this really approachable person. And I, you know, when he did say he lost his leader, I had thought for years after Senior passed away, I thought, what is this young man going through? I mean, he's he's constantly in the eyes of all of the NASCAR media. He's being photographed everywhere he goes. There's videos constantly being shot. How does he grieve? Is what I kept thinking. How does how does he grieve? I mean, because he just left, lost his father, and when he said that, that, you know, I woke up and my leader's gone. And now all of a sudden, what do I do? All of a sudden, you've got that introspection into his world of how he was grieving, what his thought process was. I, I want to roll this clip that you guys have been talking about here about Dale losing his leader and, and his father always being a ceiling. I think personally, I resonated with the conversation in a way that I didn't think that I would, again, not growing up following racing, but my father is a sports writer and I moved into audio from being a sports writer myself. And so it, it, it does hit home on a lot of levels when you fall into the family business. So let's roll that clip here. You uh, mentioned your dad and I know you said he would say he was proud of me, but he would also say some other things. And I think one thing that you mentioned at that time was he would say, well, you didn't quite fulfill your potential as a driver. And, and I agree. And, and can you sort of explain that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I um, I didn't realize the work ethic needed to to be as great as I could possibly be. And so I got partnered up with Budweiser, which had <clears throat> had dad lived he would have seen he would have probably encouraged me successfully to um be a, better at applying myself but when he passed away there were a lot of emotions that came with that one of the emotions which was um uncontrollable i felt guilty about it but it was uncontrollable i, I couldn't like I didn't get to choose how I felt when 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 something like that happens in your life you don't choose the emotions you're having they're happening and I had all the traditional ones that you might imagine um terrible terrible sadness and and you know just d dark dark depression but I had a uh, I had this odd odd strange feeling of being freed from some limitation or some bind some 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 sort of mental binding 
it was scary because now I was, I was able to make my own choices in my life, but dad was always a ceiling to protect me. He was this sort of protective. Yeah. A wall. Ozone sort of, layer. Yeah. Yeah. And that was gone. And now I had this feeling of some sort of freedom that was very dangerous, you know, and scary. Like, where's my leader? Where's my leadership? It's My leadership's gone. Speaking of fathers and sons, uh, Steph Curry, <laughs> he's got quite an origin story, which Bob McKillop tells us a lot about. As far as his recruitment and the Davidson philosophy of recruiting pro athlete sons, that was another tie that we made this season. How cool was it to connect those dots through the season as and and, and the legends as they came about? Right. Yeah, we we did Bob McKillop and we knew we were going to do him. And then Steph Curry was a an added uh, super bonus at the very end. But Bob McKillop, uh, Jeff remembers, was the only guy we did twice. We did him once, and then 17 days later, he retired. That changed a lot of things. And so even in his retirement press conference, he apologetically said to me, I'll do that interview again if you want me to. And so we did. Uh, another month or two later, and had him tell some more stories about why he left the game. But the original Steph Curry story that he told so eloquently came in the first interview where he was speaking about Steph, why he recruited this skinny, scrawny little kid that no D1 program hardly wanted. And that was uh, a clip that I'm sure you want to play, Kata, because it was so interesting The sort of Bob McKillop was on Steph Curry so much earlier, really, than anyone else was. When you were at Charlotte Christian, for those who never saw you play there, what sort of high school player were you? It's funny because it's – I mean, I could shoot. And that was kind of obviously the the my strong suit and something that uh, any team that I was on, they wanted me to do. My dad, my college coach, I mean, sorry, my high school coach, Sean Brown at, at Charlotte Christian and any a AAU coach I played for, they always told me to shoot more because I was more <laughs> of a, a, a pass first point guard. I uh, loved, you know, getting other people involved. And I, I had a lot of confidence shooting the ball, but it never was really something that I was like a volume type guy. Yeah, you, you know, didn't average that many points. Not, not in high yeah. school, no. Yeah. Um, just – didn't really look the part because I was, you know, like you said, I was uh, kind of the skinny, scrawny kid on, on every team that I played and a, a late bloomer in terms of coming into my own physically. So it was uh, – it, it made me just – it built my work ethic because I knew that that was a big part of how I was going to be successful at any level um, and that I'd have to earn everything. Now for the Knights of Charlotte Christian High School. At guard, number 20, a senior, Stephen Curry. Yeah, and speaking of the recruiting struggles, so UNC and Duke famously never recruited you, nor did any of the other majors, I don't think, right? Uh, my list came down to Davidson, Winthrop, and Virginia Commonwealth. And um, there's three really good coaches, you know, Bob McKellar, but Davidson, obviously, Jeff Capel, who was at Virginia Commonwealth, and Greg Marshall, who uh, ended up going to Wichita State. So, um <laughs> My favorite story of the journey was I played at a in a team camp at UNC Charlotte uh, the summer between my junior and senior year, and Coach K was there, Roy Williams was there, pretty much everybody from the ACC was there, and I was like, "This is my moment! Like, I'm gonna play well in this tournament. I'm gonna come home, be patient. They're gonna start calling the house, you know, asking about you know, <laughs> trying to get me on a visit or something like that, and." Uh, I thought I played well. It wasn't wasn't my best, but still felt like those calls are going to come. And you know, months passed, got into pretty much to my senior year of high school, and still was uh, you know huh. just Bob McKillop showed up at our open gyms at Charlotte Christian, <laughs> like, hey, we still have an offer for you. So um, that was uh, that's kind of part of the journey. It, it actually started with a mentality that we had in our recruiting process. I, we, I've always believed that genetics play a big part in development. So we would try to recruit the sons of ex-players. 
And as Stefan went to Charlotte Christian from there and became a, a, a very, very good high school player, uh, we immediately gravitated towards him. And if you were to see him back in those days, and there are pictures that uh, certainly portray it this way, he was boyish, baby-faced, and very frail. And it looked at oftentimes as if he was wearing Dell's uniform. <laughs> he had every character trait as a basketball player that we recruited. And we were convinced that uh, despite all of the adversity he was facing in that game, uh, he never once relented in his character strengths. And we decided right then we were going to offer him a scholarship. Jim, you know what's interesting, too, about Curry? You hear it, so many outstanding recruits. Here's a young man that uh, Roy Williams, uh, I, I think, said, hey, we just missed on this guy. You know, coming out of high school, not recruited by ACC schools. Shot, guys, two. And here he is, one of the premier players in the country without question. Did that sort of stuff stick with you and motivate you? Long term, it did because when I got to Davidson, like that's the thing I tell kids now, and anybody who asks about the journey is, my journey was for me, and I had to embrace, you know, what my opportunity was going to be and make the best choice for me, no matter where it was. And Davidson was obviously that. Um, but when I got into Davidson, I was we were playing against those teams, um, and so I kind of carried, yeah, that that chip, that motivation, like I. Even though you didn't want me, it wasn't something I like lost sleep over, but it was something that, you know, I really put the work and time in and, and had the confidence that when I got into those those type of games and, you know, the Davidson versus Dukes and Davidson versus Carolinas and, and whatnot, that I'd be able to, to perform well and, and show them who I really was. You guys went to Houston to meet with Steph Curry and you guys had some other business down there too, which was great. You were able to really maximize the trip, but it was all kind of last minute up in the air. Uh, tell me about it. You you guys had a great emotional roller coaster, uh, for lack of better words, of being excited and waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. You, yeah. you get to the point where you're so exhausted and Flying into Houston, I was just hoping, let's please get there as quickly as we can, because I was nervous about that. And then on top of that, I'm getting ready to sit down in a room with the most recognizable, what I consider to be the most recognizable NBA superstar in the world. And that's no slight to LeBron James, but Steph Curry is at the very top. I mean, he is, he is the face of the league, in my opinion. And I was scared. I mean, I was very, very nervous. And I <laughs> and I so how that, like that manifested itself was: first of all, we ate at the same restaurant three times in a row, <laughs> called Hot Biscuit in Houston, Hot some Biscuit. diner we found. Jeff liked it once, and I wanted to keep Jeff as <laughs> calm as possible, so we just kept going back. But uh, also, we, we Steph Curry's got the Golden State Warriors have a wonderful. PR man named Raymond Ritter. Mm -hmm. And Raymond Ritter is sort of an unsung hero of many warrior stories you ever see because the guy absolutely works 24-7. And uh, so anyway, we thought we were going to get Steph Curry sometime Saturday night. That's what the Warriors told us. 8.15 at the earliest p.m. It could be much later. We didn't know. But so because Jeff was nervous, and I was too, uh, you know, we had to drive to this hotel and set up equipment. We didn't know the situation. So we got to the hotel a little after seven, I yes. think. And then we got in the room and we're probably pretty thoroughly set up by 730. 730. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was hurry up and wait time for Steph Curry. It was sort of like uh, Jeff and I both have kids and it was sort of like waiting in the uh, waiting room to know when uh, the baby was coming. In this case, the baby being 34-year-old global superstar, future sportsman of the year. He was announced as Sports Illustrated's sports person of the year this week, Steph Curry. And it wasn't Steph's fault. I mean, the plane got there when the plane got there, and then Steph had a couple of other obligations. And then what time did he walk in, Jeff? Uh, I think it was around 10.50 to 10.55 p.m. Houston time. So we had a solid three or four hours in there in that in that meeting room. Um, there was a rowdy wedding going on above us. Um, and and the, we were there for so long waiting for Steph that the wedding broke up. Reception was over. They'd Those people the were out. They left. Yeah. The rice had been thrown. We outlasted the wedding. Yeah. I mean, you know, they were on the honeymoon. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're still waiting. We're going, oh my gosh, he's not coming. Something's going wrong. He's not coming. You know, and we're like, our flight was the next morning. And so finally, Steph walks in, chirpy, happy, bouncing around. You know, he had on like a, a sort of a toboggan yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, he had a toboggan yeah on, indoors yeah. and uh, smiling, just, you know, and he says, thanks for waiting, guys. I'm so sorry. Which a lot of superstars would not have said that. They'd be no, sort of like walking all. in like, okay, let's get this done. Yeah. And Scott you know? was tired of messing around with me anyway because he kept getting yeah. up and leaving the room because I have a tendency of getting really chatty and talking about nothing oh when I'm gosh. a little bit anxious. Yes. And I could tell- it, It's my favorite thing about you, Jeff. <laughs> That's oh, our well, favorite thing about you. Okay, well, thank you. Well, but, I wish you had been there you because you could have taken some of that heat. Yeah, because Scott all of a sudden announces to me as I'm standing over on the other side going on about something- that he goes, I'm going out and walk around the, the lobby for a while. And I thought, you know, I've either really gotten to him now or or he's he's getting nervous too. Yes, I was nervous, yeah. And, you know, the thing is, we've done this, both of us have done this for so long um, that I think that's one part that people wouldn't understand is that do these guys, do they feel any of this? And the answer is yes, um, because in that situation, you're dealing with, like Scott said, a global icon and – it's it's time to perform. You there's no room for error in any of this. Well, here's the thing, and this is for anyone who does any job, right? If you're excited and nervous about something in your job, you're probably doing it right, exactly. right? I no mean, doubt. it was cool, no doubt. No doubt. It no was doubt. so not, you know, it wasn't just another, you know, normal boring day. That's one reason why we love this job, honestly, right. is we get to have a lot of abnormal days, and this one was abnormal in in the best way oh yeah 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 honestly probably we got steph curry partly because he loves mckillop so much and he loves davidson and by and he and he loves charlotte you know i'm caught in between my favorite episodes i think i really enjoyed bob mckillop because as you said scott the camelot metaphors and his way of looking at the world as a whole you began coaching here. We're sitting in, in uh, inside Davidson College right now in 1989. It's been 34 years. What is it that has kept you in this place? Um, this is Camelot to me. Um, uh, there's an extraordinary intimacy here that allows someone who works here to uh, be married to the environment and fully embrace with both arms what the experience can be. Because it can be an experience not just for yourself, uh, but for your family. It, it is something that is uniquely Davidson. Uh, so it, it's family that has kept me here and uh, is probably uh, the greatest joy that I have in being here because this family has grown incredibly large as a result of this experience. Uh, but it was cultivated, it was watered, it was nurtured uh, by Kathy and our three children. You said in our first conversation, I think, that um, you, you, you've compared Davidson often, often to Camelot and you said something like, well, when you know, at some point, King Arthur has to step aside. And I can't remember what King Arthur did in Camelot once he did step aside. Uh, or uh, or I, even I if he remember, did. I, don't I can't remember the end. I, I just remember Lancelot got the girl at the but end. But I know right? Lancelot's yeah. ready. He's a handsome guy, and uh, <laughs> uh, Sir Lancelot, he might be. <laughs> it was a really, really special view into his mind that I don't think – general media can see in a post-game presser. Scott, question for you as as a reporter who has these ties with all of these people and has known these people for such a long time, did part of you see the retirement and be like, why didn't he break it to me? Yeah, sure. I mean, as a, as a reporter, you always want uh, to break news. That's That's really almost the definition of what we do is try to report the news. So, yeah, I would have loved Bob McKillop to have said it in that uh, original interview or that day, and we could have written that as well. And the funny thing is we asked him about it, and I asked him something about, 
Well, when it's time, whether it's now or 10 year, years from now, uh, you know, how ready do you think your son Matt McKillop is? And at that point when he said, well, he's pretty ready or you know, something to that effect, it did sort of in my mind go, hmm, he seems like he's really thought about this. And, but he wouldn't budge and made it sound like at the time that he was not retiring and then he did retire. So it was just one of those things. He wasn't quite ready yet. You know, people, you got to take people for where they are. And Bob McKillop wasn't quite ready to uh, break that news. So, so 17 days later, we did the whole thing over again. (laughs) And it was, you know what? I loved interviewing Bob McKillop twice. And I think Jeff, you did too. We've spoken before, but Bob McKillop should be a, a senator or something. He's absolutely a uh, just a terrific public speaker, right, Oh, Jeff? he's a wonderful, wonderful speaker. He's the kind of person that you can sit and listen to for hours. He's a storyteller. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and the details. Yeah. And the analogies. I could listen to him read books on the radio because he would keep my attention just because of his delivery. Maybe that's his next career. We could get him. we got a lot of careers for Bob McKillop. Books write a book, and then he could read books. There you go. Books yeah. on tape. Bob <laughs> McKillop. You know. <laughs> We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Another one was Wesley Walls for me. And going back to this origin story theme of deciding to go to Ole Miss and seeing, looking back through the rear view and seeing his mother in the driveway, like that was... I, I'm listening to that tape and I'm feeling very, very emotional. And I knew who Wesley Walls was, but I didn't really know who he was until this conversation. There were a lot of special episodes like that. And so I'm wondering, what what were some of y'all's favorite episodes? It might be Wesley Walls. Wesley's is a great storyteller. And the story you mentioned, uh, and we probably should run that clip, is... Uh, you know, he was crying when he was telling that story about his mother looking, him looking back at his mom in the rear view mirror. And they said, Coach Perkins is here to see you. And usually, you know, unannounced. And he comes over and he says, uh, Coach Donahue said he saw you play quarterback in the spring last year in spring practice. And um, I'd like to see you throw. And he asked me how much I weighed. It was, just, it was just, I said, I'm about 230. He says, well, don't gain another pound and commit today, and I'll let you play quarterback at the University of Alabama. Hmm. So I committed. Right then? Right on the spot. Okay. I said, I'm coming. And that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I moved to Pontotoc to play quarterback, and, yeah. and now I'm getting a chance to play in Alabama. And he said, um, he said, do you have any other visits? I said, yeah, I've got Ole Miss uh, this weekend. And he says, cancel that visit. I don't want you to take that visit. So I went home. Um, I'm still living with my dad, um, and I called over to Coach Robert Youngblood at Ole Miss and said, "I'm I can't come this weekend. I just want to let you know I appreciate all." He went to every basketball game. I was playing basketball and stuff then too, and um, I said, "I'm gonna, I need to cancel my visit." Coach Parkinson wants me to cancel, and I really appreciate all you the recruiting and, and you, Miss Judy, his his wife. Just my mom loved him. and uh, my mom came by that night again to cook dinner, and I told her I'd committed to Alabama. And she seemed okay. But my uncle Pete calls later at night. He said, I just talked to your mom. She can't stop crying. Hmm. You committed to Alabama. And I'm like, geez. You know, I said, I didn't know she didn't seem that upset. And he says, well, let's just think about it. So went to sleep, woke up next morning. I had a little job at, at a clothing store in town. It was, it was part of school credit. And I get a call at that place, and it was uh, the lady working there uh, said, Wesley, Archie Manning is on the phone for you. Really? So I think it's one of my buddies, right, Jamie or Tracy or David. And uh, and I, when I pick up the phone, I hear his voice. Say, hey, Wesley, this is Archie Manning. And I was like, this is really Archie Manning. And he said, I heard you committed to Alabama. Congratulations. What a great program, great history, tradition. He, man, we had a lot of battles and wars with those guys. He says, um, and they're going to let you play quarterback. And I said, yes, sir. I said, that's kind of why I moved to Pontotoc and – and I, was, I just want the chance. He said, well, Wesley, you know, sometimes they will recruit you and say they're going to let you play a position, but they really have no intention of ever letting you play. And I said, yes, sir, I, but they're going to give me a chance. He said, I respect that. He said, I want you to think about a couple things, though, Wesley. He said, when you get finished playing in Alabama, 
are you going to stay in Alabama or are you going to move back to Mississippi? And I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably move back home to Mississippi. He said, well, listen to what you just said. You're calling Mississippi your home. And maybe you ought to take that visit to Ole Miss this weekend. I said, you know what, Mr. Manning? Yes, sir, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and I called Ray Perkins. Archie said, Manning <laughs> with, a, with a fourth quarter comeback there. All right. I go over there, long story short, I come back Sunday night and I had to call Coach Perkins and I said, Coach, you were right. I shouldn't have gone. I'm, but I got to tell you, I'm glad I did because this is where I need to play. This is where I grew up wanting to play my whole life. I really appreciate the opportunity to play quarterback when I'm going to Ole Miss. Loaded up, and I said, "Mom, I'm going. I'm going to Ole Miss for two days." And and uh, and she hugged me, packed up that car, and drove out the driveway. And she stood in that driveway all the way down the road. I couldn't even see her anymore. But I knew then that uh, I was on a journey, a journey that my mom, my mom was a good athlete. And uh, she had given up her dreams for me, basically. And I knew then that lady gave up her life so I could have, be able to chase my dream. He's just such an authentic guy. That was a uh, that was a beautiful episode, I think, really. Um, and and he had he just had some funny stories. What would be some of yours, Jeff? Um, I mean, all of them had such wonderful. They're they're just all gold to me. I mean, to actually get into the rooms where the folks were talking. Um, of course, you know, you can relate when you listen to Wesley talk about his mom. You know, yeah, everybody's that was, had that a was, mom. That was, yeah. that's, you know, it's, it's so emotion packed. Um, you know, I, it, it, it does bring tears to your eyes. Um, and you listen, like you also mentioned Charlie Scott. I mean, you listen to the struggles that he went through and he just perseveres and he's, and he's happy and he's maintained a friendship with, the coach from Davidson, who was originally recruiting him, Lefty Drizel. They talk on the phone all the time. As a matter of fact, when we got ready to do the interview, he was on the phone with Lefty Drizel telling him, guess who's here to interview me? They're going to do this story on me and blah, blah, blah. And they Lefty's were, like, who? Yeah. like <laughs> Who are <laughs> those guys? Are. I don't know who that <laughs> is. You them in your house? <laughs> but, but, you know, it was just wonderful. I mean, that they, he still has that tight relationship. Um, I think that, you know, I think probably – my favorite of all, Roy went into discussion about, and I've and I I have a, it seems like a million Tar Heel fans, and I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Indiana, and they've always talked about Dean and Roy and the 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 legacy of UNC Tar Heel basketball. And when Roy started talking, when Scott asked him about his relationship with Dean, Dean Smith, that is, and referred to. Roy's retirement speech where he said that he goes to Dean Smith's grave to visit. That really struck a chord for me. At one point, Dean looked up at him and said, you're doing, you're doing really good. And that was just such a special moment that you could see how much it meant to Roy to recount that story because he had tears welling up in his eyes. It was that, you know, he was getting affirmation that, yes, he'd done the right thing. He had lo- he had left UNC to go to Kansas and spent several years there and was really successful. But when he came back, he was still welcomed back into the family. And the person that he cared most about was now giving him that confirmation that he'd done the right thing and that he was proud of him. And, you know, that just touches everything. And, and to me, that's, you know, that's what I want to know as the story is what – where have these people been touched by someone else? What's the impact of someone else's life on them? His love, it was love. It's truly love. But when he finished speaking, I sat there and I looked at, I was thinking to myself, if Roy Williams came recruiting either of my children, we would sign that paper right now <laughs> without question. I would sign it in a hurry. Uh, I will mention too, what, well, another thing that surprised me was uh, when I picked up Roy Williams on the way there, I almost felt like for about five seconds I was possibly going to kill us both with a what very <laughs> ill-advised left turn over four lanes of traffic that I took because I was I was like oh shoot here's my chance and I've zoomed out there and then I 
I had kind of miscalculated it. And Roy was in the passenger seat and looked at me and said, you're a lot braver than I would be in that situation. And that was not a good thing to be braver than Roy on that. He thought, because the cars were coming his way too, would have hit the passenger side before me. So I was very glad when those cars thankfully slowed down and let let us get in there and no harm, no foul, but it was a it was a very uh, disconcerting about 10 seconds. So maybe when I met Roy Williams, maybe I was sort of the calm one in this relationship. Right. It was, it was a role reversal where he goes, oh, yeah, the photographer seems normal. This other guy about <laughs> killed me. <laughs> you know, Kata, I think one of the things is, is that when you're going to – one of the key parts when you're doing a podcast and you're, you're interviewing and photographing um, people, anyone, is that you've got to like people. You've got to want, you've got to be open to people. You've got to be receptive to them. And you, you, you're there. You want to know their story. And you convey that by the way you meet people when you first greet them and your look and your, you know, your whole presentation. You, you, we like people. And that's what I think makes, why this makes this very successful is, is that they know that we have a genuine interest, that we're, we want, we want to know more than just, baskets or laps or something like that. We want to know them as people. And I think that's a whole different thing. You get two people working together that both relate very well with one another and can both express that to the subject. It, it just makes everything better. Sometimes, too, if you've got a while with somebody, you certainly don't ask the hardest questions at the beginning or the ones that are a little thorny uh, at the beginning. And so with Roy Williams, for instance, I've always kind of wanted to ask him about his timeouts because he was legendary among UNC fans for not using them. And so I asked him a question about his timeouts, and I could tell when I asked him, he was sitting right where Jeff's sitting right now, he, he bristled for a second, and then he sort of relaxed, and he just gave the, a, what I thought was an extremely honest answer that sometimes he wouldn't call timeout and tell his assistants, let's just give him something to talk about. Love that answer, and that's a clip probably that uh, we should run. People always ask facetiously, but um, about where you ever kept those extra timeouts. You did not bring them with you today, but what was your sort of philosophy on people always? Oh, uh, old Roy doesn't call enough timeouts. He doesn't stop the run. So, what was that all, all about? Right now, I'm so stubborn. I don't care. We won some freaking games. How many games <laughs> you, would you have won? You know the way I did it my way. <laughs> Frank, yeah, Frank 903 Sinatra. is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. <laughs> it started out because I knew we were going to be prepared. I didn't have to call a timeout. Regardless of what you did, we were prepared. So why should I call a timeout to get help you get your team prepared? Uh, and one example, the best example is in uh, 17. We're playing Kentucky. Malik Monk makes that tremendously difficult three to tie the game. This is the game to go to the final four. Monk to tie it. Oh, an impossible shot. We get the ball out of bounds, get it in quickly. We go down. Theo makes a pass. Luke May makes a shot. We go to the final four. Looks up, driving in. May for the win. North Carolina with 0.3 seconds to go. An incredible. John Calipari's, we're leaving. We walk out together. John's a good friend. I mean, I love coaches. They're my favorite people. But he said, I was trying to call a timeout. I knew you weren't going to call a timeout. I wanted to get the defense set, but you got it in so fast. And that was it. You know, so anytime anybody said, I wish I'd had a tape recorder under my uh, shirt and I'd pull it out and said, John, repeat that. So anytime any <laughs> idiot asked that question, I'd just say that. But uh, <laughs> but at the end, Scott, I'll tell you this, sometimes I wouldn't call it just so I'd give him something to talk about. No way. Oh, he wouldn't. Really? You somebody are stubborn. Said, oh, somebody said, you want to call a time? I said, no, let's give him something to talk about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that's exactly the way it was. But just uh, that play right there personified truly what I believed that we were prepared. You guys did such a fantastic job with that, which makes my job really easy. And it's it's fun to go and listen to these interviews again. Like I will throw my hand up and say I am a member of the millennial class, not Gen Z, but millennial. And I I knew of a lot of these people, but I learned so much working through this and getting to know these people and just having this new affinity for 
an era of sports that maybe I wasn't so familiar with. So I want to thank you guys for giving me that. I am so excited to see what's coming up. Going forward, what what can we expect in the future? Are we looking at a season two? Well, uh, we're proud to announce that we think we will have a season two of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Uh, hopefully with the same cast. I sure hope you'll come back, Kata, and Jeff and I are committed to doing it in 2023 other than that lots of surprises we had a bunch of them last year and and we look forward to having some more this year it's going to be so sick well i want to thank you guys again for giving me an education in carolina's sports history having grown up there but not necessarily as a sports fan and sharing your experiences with us in a way that peeling back the curtain on some of these relationships i that's one of the reasons I was excited about the podcast, and I I really appreciate you both, Jeff and Scott, for giving us that opportunity. Well, we can't thank you enough, Kata, for everything you've done. It's been uh, been a real pleasure, and and we hope we can run it all back. Yeah, you've been a real trooper, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy with you two, I'm telling you. But thank you guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the first season of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. This episode featured Raina Cash, Jeff Siner, and Kata Stevens. The show is produced by Jeff Siner and Kata Stevens. Raina Cash is the executive editor at the Charlotte Observer. Special thanks to Raina Cash, Matt Stevens, Tay Pham, KJ Edelman, Michaela Holder, Justin Pelletier, and Lydia Craver of the Charlotte Observer. McClatchy's Director of Audio is Davin Coburn. And McClatchy's Vice President of Audience Growth and Content Monetization is Cynthia DuBose. For lots more sports coverage and to continue supporting this kind of work, please consider a digital subscription to the Charlotte Observer. To hear the entire first season of our show, including exclusive bonus episodes, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. We'll be back before long with more Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Until then, connect with me at Scott underscore Fowler on Twitter or by email at sfowler at charlotteobserver.com. See you soon.